Good morning. Would you stand together as we read the sentences of worship? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Today, as we worship, we celebrate the reign of Christ. Christ Jesus, friend of the poor, the meek, and the merciful, has been enthroned above all authority and power in this world and in the world that is to come. God has placed everything under Christ's wounded feet, appointed the one who wore a crown of thorns as the supreme head of the church, his body. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, give thanks and praise his loving name. enter into this sanctuary to give you praise for you are majestic and holy and you are a refuge for us you are a strong tower and you are merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love we thank you Lord we pray on this day remembering those on this Memorial Day weekend who gave their lives so that we, as the United States of America, might have the freedoms, which includes the freedom to gather together. We thank you for their sacrifices, and we pray, Lord, that it would point us to you and to your sacrifice on our behalf, Lord Jesus. 
that you died so that we might live. As we worship together, would you help us to hold in tension sorrow over sin and the effects of sin with joy, knowing that you have ultimately shown your triumph over death and the grave, and we one day will be with you in resurrection glory. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning and welcome, Mountain Brook Baptist and guests to the service of worship where we have gathered to worship the Lord together. If you're a guest with us, there's a little four guest tab in the worship guide. If you take that out and fill it out, there's a box in the narthex where you can place it. Also, we want to give a big thanks to Matt Gaines, who is leading us today in worship. And we want to be praying for our student ministry uh, mission trip to Casa Monte Plata in the Dominican Republic to go and work with Ann Peyton Baker. They left this morning about 4.15 from the parking lot, so be in prayer for them. As we continue in worship, Ms. Sharon will come to lead the children's sermon. Good morning. So today is known as Ascension Sunday. Now, that's the day that we remember that Jesus rose up into heaven. Let me remind you about a couple of things. First of all, before Jesus died on the cross, he told his disciples. It's noted in John chapter 14. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, you're going to get to live with me forever and ever. Then Jesus died on the cross. We know that he's alive. During the period before he went back to heaven, remember he saw his disciples, he saw his friends, he even had breakfast on the beach, and then his disciples saw him rise into heaven. So that's pretty cool. Dr. Splawn is going to preach from the book of Psalms, and he's going to talk about how God is in control and worthy to be praised. Now, whenever I talk about how to become a Christian, the first thing that we talk about is God rules. You see, he is in control. He had a plan from the very, very beginning. And as as you listen to the message, I want you to listen for three things. One, we're going to And we praise him with our actions, we praise him with our words, and it's so important that we obey him. And B, believe, we worship a God who keeps his promises. God promised us a Savior, and he sent us Jesus. And when we believe in him, we can... Roll. We worship an all-powerful God that said, let there be, and there was. You remember, God created the heaven and the earth, the moon, the stars, the flowers, the animals, the people, and he said it was good. So our God is awesome, and my prayer for you is that you will want to learn more about the person he wants you to become because he loves you so much. As we prepare our hearts to pray, I'm going to read a passage from Psalm 71, verses 12 through 16. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. I invite you to pray with me. Father, we are grateful for the gift of this day. And we thank you that your presence And your provision in our lives is as certain as the sun that rose this morning. We thank you that you give us opportunity to gather in this room as a family of faith to worship you together. 
We thank you that we do not walk through this life of faith alone, but you provide us others. And Lord, I confess that I have been so encouraged this morning already from the fellowship of this church. We pray for those who can't be here today who would love to gather in person for worship. And we pray that you would be with them and that you would strengthen and sustain them. That you would give us a heart of compassion. That we would be faithful to love and support and encourage them when their health prohibits them from coming. Lord, we pray that you would help us today to be reminded afresh of the fact that you do reign even now. And Lord, as we are burdened with grief over the things that we see happening in our world so often, that we would also be faithful to acknowledge the ways that we see your gracious and mighty and merciful hand at work in our world. That we would not let the rocks cry out, but we would cry out. That we would tell of your mighty deeds, that our hearts would be moved to sincere and joyful worship of who you are and all you've done in anticipation of the day when you will return and make all things new. Between this day and that day, we pray that you would help us be found faithful as your people. Pray for those whose hearts are heavy with grief and who mourn. For those who lost children, spouses, and loved ones in Texas this past week. For those over the course of this month who have lost loved ones to violence. Pray for those who have been the victims of abuse. And Lord, we pray that you would give us faith that your justice one day will roll down like waters in the mountain. Help us to be a part of that work even now. Holy Spirit, be at work in our worship. We might be more faithful people when we leave this place. And we offer this prayer in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
be seated. The offertory reading today comes from Deuteronomy 16 and verse 17. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Today, as we think about offering what has been given to us back to the Lord, we think about our mission partners at Refuge and Hope in Kampala, Uganda. Sheila and Jade Acker are the founders of this ministry, and they are doing wonderful work with refugees in Uganda. There are more than 10,000 refugees who have poured into Uganda in recent days, and they are helping them with professional development and with spiritual development and with counseling and social services. As we pray for them, a way that you can get more connected with them is through the e-newsletter and also by contacting Kurt Stokes. Will you pray with me? Father, we are reminded that your gifts to us are great and many. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to give back in proportion to what has been given to us. We pray for Sheila and Jade Acker and all those who work with Refuge and Hope in Uganda. We pray, Lord, for their safety. We ask for their families, that you would give them wisdom. And we pray, Lord, that you would help those who are seeking refuge to ultimately find spiritual refuge in you. Thank you that we can partner with many around the world who are seeking to take your name and your love to those around us. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. word comes from Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Fire goes before him, consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth is and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols, worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked." Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
as we affirm our faith by reading or reciting the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and now sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whom he shall come to judge the living I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, and everlasting life. Amen. I invite you to find a Bible and turn to Psalm 47. Psalm 47. It's on page 403 if you're using the Pew Bible. There in front of you. As Mary mentioned, um, I would encourage you to be praying this week for our mission team. They're currently in Philadelphia, and they're going to be there for most of the day and leave, I think, about four this afternoon for their flight to the Dominican Republic. You know, it's the way life is these days. You leave Birmingham and go to Philadelphia to go to Dominican Republic. But just pray for safety for them. Um, today, a meaningful work in the week to come. Psalm 47, beginning in verse 1. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations, God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When is the last time you were so excited and filled with joy that you jumped up out of your seat and you clapped your hands and you shouted, When's the last time that happened to you? Perhaps it was at a sporting event. So I talk a lot about sports, especially youth sports, because that's my life right now. And one night I was down in Calera recently. I'm sure all of you were just there this weekend. I was down in Calera. It was about 10 o'clock at night. This is the craziness that is youth sports these days. Saturday... It was the bottom of the seventh. We only play six innings normally, but we were tied zero to zero. Bases were loaded. There were two outs. And one of the tallest, best-looking kids on the team walked up to the plate. And I had a sneaking suspicion of what was about to happen. And sure enough, the ball comes across the plate He smacks it off into the May evening, and over the right field fence it goes. Now, how do you think I responded? I mean, I was doing this number. I was looking for somebody to hug. I was high-fiving. It was one of those moments where something happened before you that it just evoked praise and celebration and joy out of you. No one told me to do it. No one said, hey, you should get up and you should celebrate. It just naturally flowed out from what I had witnessed before me. Those of you who are Auburn fans probably think about that football player that caught the field goal that didn't go quite far enough, and he ran all the way down. 
I can remember looking at that stadium on television and people, they lost their minds. Strangers hugging each other. Probably measured on the Richter scale somewhere. When they saw it, they just exploded with praise and celebration. Clapping, shouting, joy. I've never been on a battlefield, but I imagine if I were to be on a battlefield and my regiment was um, about to be defeated and then comes the cavalry, and the cavalry comes over the hill and they save us, I imagine people in those moments rejoice. I imagine they jump up and down and celebrate and they are filled with praise. Now here's a question I want you to ask yourselves. Has that ever happened to you in church? Has that ever happened to you in church? It's one of those things that I think we don't think about enough. That there is a part of worship, there is a part of reverence that can lead us to be silent before God. It can lead us to be in awe and reverence such that we are quiet and dignified. But if you read the Psalms, the Psalms take note of that. They, They express worship that is quiet and reserved idea to be still and know that the Lord is God. But the Psalms also are filled with this other part of life, and we're called to rejoice. i got to tell you, when I read Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2 this week in my study, listen again to what the sons of Korah write. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. I was in my office and I was making notes on this and I said, I don't know that I've seen this very much. And I pulled out Alan Ross, one of my professors in seminary, his commentary on the Psalms. And I turned to this um, Psalm 47 and what he had to say. And this is what he said. The expressions used in this Psalm do not allow for a muted or lifeless doxology that so often occurs in congregations. A muted or lifeless doxology that so often occurs in congregations. See, I don't think our church is unique in this. Congregations, he says, those he's been exposed to in his past, that that there can be a form of worship that feels muted and lifeless. As I thought about worship and I thought about praise and I thought about joy this week and I thought about the ways in which the Psalms over and over again command us to worship the Lord in a way that is beyond just going through the motions but that is full-hearted, joyful, It's occurred to me that that praise is so important because it it shapes our heart and our life to to what is the reality of the world that we live in. This past week, you and I have been barraged again with bad news. Horrific news. And it's been the case as long as God's people have been walking the earth that, that bad things have been happening. And this fundamental truth that you see all over the Psalms is that even now, the Lord reigns. That He is King, that He is exalted over the nations. And the Psalms wrestle with what it means to be people of faith who acknowledge God's Lordship and His sovereign rule on the earth while also walking through difficulty and hardship that that seems to call those things into question for us. If you've been a believer any amount of time, you've wrestled with those kind of questions. When your faith and your experience don't seem to line up. And sometimes it's the case that we allow truths other than Scripture, we allow 
the news or we allow whatever we read or what we hear about going on in other people's lives to sometimes shape our hearts so much that, that we walk around just like non-believers in despair and frustrated. And if that happens in your heart long enough, it really does get you to a place where, where sports or politics or maybe money or there has to be something in your life that moves you to praise. One of my professors in seminary would say often, and I'm sure it's not original with him, to praise is to live. You and I can't help but praise someone or something. And when we don't understand and engage deeply in praising and worshiping the Lord, we walk through life and we don't experience the joy, even in the midst of hardship, that God would have us to know. There's this pattern I want you to have in your mind as you think about worship. That oftentimes our worship or our joy or our excitement moves from despair to deliverance to doxology. To despair, from despair to deliverance to doxology. And the greater the despair, the more meaningful the deliverance and the more exuberant the doxology. I want to say that one more time. The greater the despair, the more meaningful the deliverance, and the more exuberant the doxology. Take yourself back to that situation out at the ball field. When the young man hit the home run, and he's probably hit 30 this year, I don't know. He's hit more than I ever hit when I was a child, I'll tell you that. But if it's the top of the first or the bottom of the first and we're winning... I don't act the same way, do I? No, I mean, I clap. Good job. Excited you hit another one. But when the situation is dire, when the game is on the line, so to speak, and something monumental like that happens, then you can't help but rejoice in a way that's fitting for the situation. We don't know exactly what was happening in Psalm 47, don't know the exact moment of deliverance that God's people had experienced. But whatever it was, it seems clear that they were in a situation where they knew that they were despairing. They knew that things were difficult and probably even beyond their ability to win. That's one of the major storylines throughout the Old Testament, that God goes out of his way to put his people in situations that they can't overcome in their own resources and their own abilities so that over and over again it will be clear that he is the one who's delivered them. And so as they reflect on God's deliverance and his salvation, there is this party that erupts of praise and joy and clapping of hands. That God is king over all the earth and it's the subject of their praise. Now there's a part of this psalm that surely anticipates something later to come. There's a part of this psalm that is not full in and of itself, this idea that God reigns. And when we turn to the New Testament, the writers of the New Testament would often pick up on what God has done through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and they would talk about Christ overcoming enemies for us so that even now he's exalted at the right hand of the Father. And one of the places that we see this is in Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Paul writes, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He's called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. Now, it's important to note that Paul prays 
that the Spirit would allow them to see the full significance of all that God had given them in Jesus. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Every Sunday ought to be for us a mini Easter. We gather on Sunday because it's the day of what? Resurrection. We gather on Sunday because it's the day of resurrection. How many of you are here on Easter Sunday? Anybody? You and a lot more other people were here on Easter Sunday. And we go all out on Easter Sunday, don't we? We've got extra musicians. We sing uh, Handel's Messiah. I think the Hallelujah Chorus. Is that what it is? The Hallelujah Chorus. I mean, we go all out on Easter Sunday because we're celebrating the what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ and this event that has changed everything for you and for me. But then in subsequent Sundays, it seems like we go back to the ho-hum normal stuff, don't we? Like, all right, I'll go to church today. I guess I should. I guess I should go up there to church. And, it, and, we, and we lose some sense of, the good news of the gospel of what Jesus has done for us through his life and his death and his resurrection and that even now he's at the right hand of the Father and all things have been put under subjection under his feet. And you and I, every Sunday when we come to church, in our good days and in our bad days, and things seem to be going right, and things seem to not be going right. We gather together on Sundays, and we remind ourselves of the truth. That Christ came into the world, that he took on flesh, that he lived a perfect life, that he died in our place on the cross, and that through faith in him, because of the resurrection, you and I have been declared completely righteous before God, and we're reconciled to others And it ought to fill us with this sense of joy that would cause us to almost have to sit on our hands that we want to clap so loudly. I would guess that when you're in this room, have you ever felt like clapping and you didn't? Anybody? I have. I felt like clapping and I didn't. And so the question might be, well, why didn't I? And there can be a way in which we can take on a reservedness that that sometimes is counterintuitive or counterproductive for shaping our hearts to be people who praise. That our hearts would be full that joy would overflow, and that as God brings people in from the outside, and we say, we've been given the best news in the whole world. And they're like, really? (laughs) Doesn't look like it maybe today. But there's this truth that, that God has done something in Jesus that ought to cause us to praise. And not half heartedly, but but wholeheartedly. So I want you to know that when you're in worship, feel free to clap or to shout or to sing for joy. And if somebody, you know, looks at you funny, just show them Psalm 47. And say, I'm just being obedient to what the Scripture calls me to. And truly that everything else in my life might be beating me down and my heart might be heavy. And I need to praise the Lord. 
I need to be reminded of the truth of what God has done for me. I need to express this as fully as I can so that I might make it through this week. Understanding that God reigns even now. One more passage in closing. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is 1 Corinthians 15. And it's this passage where Paul talks about the reality and the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. And he starts early on in the chapter and he says, I'll remind you what I delivered to you as of first importance. That Christ died in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried. And that on the third day he rose from the dead and then he appeared to all these people to show the reality that he had indeed been raised from the dead by the power of the Spirit. Because he, he went over these things because people were questioning the truth and the reality of resurrection. And Paul says, if Christ hasn't been raised, then nobody's been raised, nobody will be raised, and we're still in our sins. And he addresses this, this difficulty and this struggle of faith that we feel sometimes living between Christ's first resurrection and ascension and his return. And I want you to listen to what he says in verse 24. I'll start in verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. There is this truth that, that even now Christ reigns. But Paul acknowledges that, that the last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. And when you and I go to the graveside of a loved one, or when we get ready to die, the truth that gives us hope and joy even in the face of that is the truth that Christ will one day return. And we don't deny the hardships. We don't act like they're not real. We don't try to explain away the difficulties and suffering and sorrow of the world. But we also don't give in to that as the final reality. And we trust and we believe through eyes of faith that one day Christ will return. And let me... Let me just read to you what will happen on that day. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? I don't know how many organists or brass players or members they'll be in the choir that day. But I can tell you that when that day comes, you and I, we won't be lifeless or muted. We'll be rejoicing wholeheartedly that our faith has become sight. And I invite you even now to enter into that kind of life. Praise the Lord even when you don't feel like it. Praise the Lord at all times. And praise the Lord with joy. Maybe in a way that makes other people a little bit nervous. Because you and I, our lives are dependent upon us. Being people who are joyful about the right things. May it be that God would fill each of our hearts with this deep sense of joy and excitement about who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the truths of Scripture. And Father, we confess that, that oftentimes we, we get excited about everything other than you. We'll praise restaurants, or we'll praise sports teams, or we'll praise fill in the blank. But Lord, we pray that you would give us by the power of your Spirit, the ability to see and understand the significance of all that you've done for us in Jesus. 
that we would understand that apart from Him, we were in despair. But that You delivered us by Your great mercy. I pray that that would move us to doxology, to praise, that others may be invited into that same joy that is ours. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you um, so much for being here this morning. I pray that your presence here was an encouragement to you, that the Lord spoke to you, and that, that hopefully, as you walk out the doors here in a few minutes, that you have reason to rejoice and to praise God for who He is and what He's done um, for us. And we always invite people to respond after sermons. And sometimes, I'll, it feels perfunctory sometimes. Do you think that? Sometimes, if we're not careful, it could be We're just doing it. We're going through the motions. But I invite you this morning, if the Lord's spoken to you, if He's called you to understand maybe for the first time the good news of the gospel of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, that that you would respond if you haven't responded in faith. And if you don't feel comfortable coming down forward, know that I would always love to meet with you and talk more about that at your convenience. If you're looking for a church home, um, know that we would love to have you here at Mount Brook Baptist Church. However it is that the Lord's leading you to respond, invite you to do so as we stand and sing. to be here today. Um, One note I would uh, put before you, next Sunday I will not be here. Now why didn't you moan or something? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Next Sunday I will not be here. Um, I'll be out of town for a wedding, Um, but Dr. Gary Fenton will be preaching next week. Um, It will also be Mark Rector's first Sunday here, so if you see him, our new associate minister, make sure you speak to him and let him know. If he looks confused or lost, make sure you point him in the right direction. Okay. Make sure you're in prayer for our youth mission team. Kelly and those will be coming back this week, I'm pretty sure. And so be in prayer for everyone who's traveling and moving, and I hope that you have a wonderful uh, Memorial Day. Please remain standing as our choir dismisses us.